Champion Series in Abu Dhabi. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. It's now time for the featured bout of the evening. From the four corners of the world to the four corners of this ring, the fight starts now! Well, from wherever you're watching around the world, a very warm November welcome to the UAE. We are just three days away from a huge fight night here in Abu Dhabi as Russia's Dmitry Bivar, after a stunning performance against Canelo Alvarez, walks back into the fire against another brilliant Mexican in Gilberto Ramirez. WBA Light Heavyweight World Champion on the line Saturday night, live on the zone. Uh, we'll be live from 2 p.m. Uh, out here, which is Saturday afternoon if you're in the UK, 10 a.m. Eastern if you're in the US, and uh, 6 a.m. Pacific before the early rises. We've got a bit of an event on here, Eddie Home. We've got the punch machine. I know you're aching yeah, to tell yeah. us who's leading the way with that after 19 goes, pretending it was Simon Jordan. Um, what was it, 900 and what? It's, it's a mere 90. Two, four, Chris. Load the neck. He's going to load the neck. He's right hook. Up. Yeah, the, the, the straight it's right all... hand wasn't registering. I switched it out with the right hook. Boom. You know, and, and 16 I mean, and a half stone behind and it. Actually, and actually, you know, went past the number of former world champions uh, who, who tried, including difference. the man to my right. But that's all right. He only had 27 goes also, and I'm sure he'll have a few more later. <laughs> uh, that is our running order for this afternoon. We have got uh, nine fights on the undercard before the main event. And that is the fighters that we're going to go through this afternoon in the ring, on the pads, going through their workouts. And we were talking about all of them ahead of a big night live on the zone Saturday night from Yas Island in Abu Dhabi. Chris Lloyd here with Darren Barker uh, and Eddie Herm. We've got a few uh, about to go through the pace of the ring. David Diamante is standing by. Uh, this is a, a new venture for, for us, isn't it? Incredibly exciting. I mean, you know, Abu Dhabi now has become a real sort of global destination for major sporting events. We've got a tough act to follow. Two weeks ago was an incredible UFC event in Abu Dhabi in the same arena, the Etihad Arena. Uh, I think a week or two before that was NBA. And in two weeks' time, you've got F1. So uh, we needed to come in with a great fight, with a great card. And I really believe we've done it. You know, Bivol Ramirez, I think one of the top fights of the year, but not just that. Cameron against McCaskill for undisputed. Zelfa Barrett going for the world title. Galau Yafai, Cal Yafai, Campbell Hatton, Aki Fiaz. Tremendous fight card from top to bottom. And, uh, you know, the stars are flying into Abu Dhabi this week. AJ's in town, Oscar De La Hoya's in town, Haney's in town, Darren many Barker others. Da Darren Barker, he's here, anyway. former world middleweight champion. It's the quietest course. he's ever been. Can't yeah. crack an egg. Yeah, well, you yeah, right. You had a good jab. And, um, but it's a, a big moment for us as a business. You know, the Middle East is going to play a very important role in all global sport, but particularly in boxing. And as, as a global promotional business, we need to be here. And obviously, off the back of two world championship, heavyweight world championship events in Saudi Arabia, it's great to start this journey with DCT and Abu Dhabi and the Champion Series. And it all gets underway on Saturday night. It does indeed. Well, let's see the first of our fighters in the ring this afternoon. David Diamante is going to bring him to the ring. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Yaz Mall here yet in Yaz Island, Abu Dhabi for the open workout for a big night of World Championship Professional Boxing taking place on Saturday night at the Etihad Arena. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. It'll be shown live around the world exclusively on DAZN. And we're sponsored by Palm Sports 
and WOW Hydrate. It's a great fight card. We've got 10 fights on the card. There are four title fights. We have an undisputed world title at the top of the bill. Dimitri Bivol and Herberto Zerdo Ramirez go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Two undefeated fighters. It's a Nixon and nil fight for the WBA Light Heavyweight Championship of the world. Now, as I said earlier, this is the open workout, so we're going to go ahead and start today with a fighter from Dubai. He is undefeated in his young campaign, 7-0, four knockouts. Fighting out of Dubai, UAE, goes by the nickname Surastis. Please welcome Majid Al-Nakbi. Al-Nakbi. Oh. smiles, the first fighter of the afternoon here in the the Asmo. one of three Emirati fighters that have been added to this undercard this is Majid al Nakbi. he's a three-time national champion now undefeated 7-0 super lightweight prospect from Dubai he's got four knockouts from those seven wins he was on the Anthony Joshua Andy Ruiz undercard in Diria Saudi Arabia December 2000 and 19 to beat Ili Berishvili. You can probably hear Eddie Hearn singing behind me. Do a justice set. A very confident young man, small, compact fighters, boxed. His last three around 140 pounds. He's pretty game, busy, works the body well. Several of these lads, Eddie, just based in a, a, a local gym, small local gym. I mean, this is a, an opportunity they couldn't have imagined. Yeah, recently, six months ago. I mean, I'm not sure how you know how they're going to manage on Saturday night in the Etihad Arena with 10, 11,000 people there. But this is part of the development of what we're trying to do here in the region: a long-term vision to build from grassroots all the way up to elite level. So, increased participation among the younger generation, give amateur fighters a chance to succeed in major tournaments, world championships and Olympics and give professional fighters a platform to try and progress because at the end of the day, if you don't get the chance to progress, if there aren't regular shows, you have no opportunities as a pro fighter. So three Emirati fighters fighting on the card on Saturday, a massive opportunity for them. And I'm watching because if I can unearth one superstar from this region, the game changes here. And you know, these guys have got a golden opportunity. Is there any? Is there going to be any help for the associations over here, the amateur associations? Because for me, when I look at these, and I, you know, you do your prep and you look at the fighters, they're, they're talented. But for me, the hard thing is they don't have that solid foundation from the, the amateurs. Do you know what I mean? They don't have the competition as the, the, the likes of us back home. Is that something you're going to sort of not necessarily invest in, but spend a bit of time in trying to help develop? Yeah, the young that's talent? that's really you know. It's, it's often called a cradle to grave mentality where you're taking a fighter through the whole transition of you know, when they first lace up a pair of gloves to hopefully get into world championship level. That really comes from opportunities, facilities, coaching through the amateur system. And one thing that I feel like this region will invest in is that development of coaching, you know, that performance. We want to build our own performance center here. You know, like you, we always try and emulate in many ways a lot of what the UFC do. They're an incredible organization, but it's always been a dream of mine to create a facility like a where, yeah, like elite athletes can go. And you know, if you go to the UFC Institute in Las Vegas, it is incredible. Like nutrition, you know, just medical advice, performance, everything. And it's like, I would love to build something here where young elite fighters from the region can train and get the best opportunities in coaching. But also our global stable can use. I mean, you know, you're an ex-fighter. Imagine the opportunity. I'll manage it. Yeah, you, you'll manage it. You would have lived there if you were doing it when we fought. But, like, you know, that's really... When you talk about fighters living the life, that's really a place where... Because in your downtime as a fighter, you shouldn't really be going on holiday, out partying, drinking, enjoying yourself. That's the reality, right? If you want to be an elite fighter, if you want to go down in history and create legacy, you have to live the life 365 days a year. So when you're not fighting, when you're not in training camp, to be out there, to be you know, getting physio, getting treatment on your body, to be recovering, whether it's hyperbaric chambers, whether it's cold water therapy, you know, whatever it is, to prepare yourself for the next camp. Because if you look at the elite fighters, you know, Mayweather's a great example, it's the lifestyle, you know, and it's a short lifestyle, it's a very short span. But to create that facility where, you know, 
I mean, not, not dropping any names, but my pal Odell Beckham Jr. was out here, you know, and it, a lot of these, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a lot of a lot of these athletes are now using this part of the world for those kind of facilities because they are second to none. And, you know, I think there's a real desire from Abu Dhabi and the DCT to create those kind of facilities, not just for elite athletes at the moment, but to develop these young fighters. Because as you say, without the amateur foundations, it's very unlikely that a fighter is just going to turn professional with no amateur experience and go and be a force in the professional game. But you saw, you know, if you go back to the anti Joshua card in Saudi with, with Emirati fighters and local fighters, the atmosphere is incredible in the arena and they really get behind them and, and that can change everything. Really, one, one star from this region. You need someone to inspire the younger generation. So he's with uh, Coach Gadar on the pad from uh, Kane's Boxing Academy, which is on Airport Road, just uh, a couple of miles from where we are now. They're a small stable of local fighters. They were visited by uh, Dimitri Bivolt, Roberto Ramirez, uh, and Freddie Roach this week as well, which you can imagine for uh, kids Thank like that. So, like, they can hear us over Ladies and gentlemen, get your hands together you can imagine there, for kids like that, meeting the likes of Bivol and Ramirez and Freddie Roach this week in their local gym. Today. An amazing experience. Great to see you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's... That you have, it's it, I guess it's the benchmark. Yeah. If you're these young fighters in the gym and you're seeing these sort of guys that have, have hit the heights of the sport, it, it rubs off. That, that's where you're, you know, you're right. aiming, aiming to get Good. to. That's the pinnacle of sport. And I think along with the, the amateur setup, those sort of influences being here make a big difference. All right, well, Majid Anakbi has uh, gone through his workout. He's in against uh, John Lawrence Ordonio. Uh, for San Fernando in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, our next contest, six rounds in the lightweight division. We've got a gentleman coming up right now. He's also from Dubai in the UAE. 10 and 1, two knockouts. Kid Amirati, ladies and gentlemen, Fahad Al Blushi. Al Blushi. So the Emirati kid, Farad Al Balushi, he's 26 years of age, half Pinoy, half uh, Emirati, super featherweight, 10 1 with two KOs. He was scheduled to face uh, a six round rematch with Georgi Gotchasvili, who uh, handed him his only career defeat when they met in 2019 in Kazakhstan. But I have word that his opponent has been rescheduled for Saturday night. The kind of fights, uh, you may see it on the pads, I'm not sure, the kind of fights Philly Shell, shoulder roll, counters off the, the lead. And then with his coach now, we'll see him uh, go through the pad routine. He said he's excited to be on this card. What he says is, without a doubt, the biggest night in UAE boxing history. For these kids to all be part of before the belt, starting at 6 p.m. here local time, going through to about half past nine, where we'll go live on the main card with former world champion at Superfly with Khalid Yafai. His brother, Olympic gold medalist Galau Yafai from the Tokyo Games, Elfa Barrett and Shavkat Rakimov in competition for the IVF Super Featherweight World title as well. Chantel Cameron and Jess McCaskill contesting all the belts at £140 before Dimitri Bivol makes yet another defence of his WBA World Light Heavyweight title against the former Super Middleweight World Champion, the tall figure of Mexico's Gilberto Ramirez. I guess going back to what we were talking about, and not to get too tactical now, but the likes of these fighters that don't have that amateur pedigree, that background, is, I feel, defensively. When you watch these fighters in their previous fights, when they let their hands go, they're decent. I think it's when shots are fired back at them, they don't really know how to defend properly. They're, they're not really been under the cosh at a decent level. And I think that is one of the things that needs to be improved on. Is that a reflection of the standard of coaching? Absolutely. Well, the, the coaching Or just and, the experience the of being in those situations. Look, you know how important sparring is as part of your development. Coaching is crucial. The, the opposition, the quality of opposition, it's everything. It, it's, it, it really is everything. But I feel these fighters over here at game, they, they, they want to get stuck in. They, they want to make names for themselves. They want to change their lives. But... You can only end up doing that with the right tutelage. When you look at coaches now, obviously Tony Sims, your coach, would be big on defence and you know 
all-rounded skills. You look at a lot of coaches these days, the emphasis seems to be on attacking pad work, you know, and, and rather than actually studying the sport and, and the defensive side of the sport. Uh, look, do you know what, for me, and, and to, look, my dad used to always say to me when I was a kid, if they can't hit you, they can't win. So first and foremost, start off with defence. Work from there, look, cover your bases defensively, then work on with the other stuff. But I think that the nature of boxing, certainly now, um, the money that's been invested in the sport is about entertainment. So you've got to look good, you've got to look dangerous, you've got to look spiteful. And I feel that's why it's shifted ever so slightly now. Uh, let's hear that there once again for Hard Out Blushy, ladies and gentlemen from Dubai. 10 and 1, 2 knockouts. They'll be fighting Saturday night. Kid Emirati, ladies and gentlemen. Looking good. Our next fighter coming in is the son of a legend, and he's now undefeated as a professional. Eight fights, eight victories, two of them coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of Manchester, England, ladies and gentlemen, get up for Campbell. The Hurricane Hatton. Hatton. It's the third outing this year for Campbell Hatton. He was out five times in his first year as uh, a professional at a well-earned break over Christmas. And, and Eddie, I think, consensus was last year and, and he agreed with us that he just moved pretty quickly and, and probably in front of the crowds a little bit too early in his career particularly against Sonny Martin is on the AJ Usyk undercard where he kind of almost came unstuck and just the, the plan to move him around the kind of the European circuit a little bit just slightly under the radar and he's starting to, to look a little bit stronger and, and more together this year. Yeah I mean firstly I think it's very difficult as we've seen with Campbell, with Chris Eubank, with Connor. you're always going to be compared to your, your dad. And in this, in those instances, your dad was a legend of British boxing. You know, you're talking about comparing him to Ricky Hatton. You know, box Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao, have one of the biggest followings in British boxing history. So in that respect, it's very difficult. He's not his father. He didn't have the amateur success that his father had. Probably doesn't have the ability that his father had at this moment in his career. Doesn't mean that's not to come. But, you know, I go along the other route. I think if you're going to walk that path you're going to have to be thrown into situations that quite frankly others wouldn't be thrown into particularly going out and boxing in front of 70,000 at Spurs in what was what his third fight or something like that I mean looking back that's pretty brutal tough like tough at the end of the day he's getting these opportunities because of the name right someone else with his amateur pedigree wouldn't be getting these opportunities now he's got to improve and get respect on his own name and you do that by putting in the performances I respect him because I know how hard he's working and I know he's improving but there's a long way to go with Campbell Hatton but also at the same time you are getting to the point where you're going to start moving to eight rounds the fights are going to start getting tougher and before you know it you're going to be at 10 rounds and then after a while you're going to have to fight for English titles and British titles and you have to go through the levels and if you don't go through the levels this is a game of snakes and ladders and you will, you will, you will fall back down the board. But Campbell is giving himself every opportunity, and I think what we've done is right. We we took him behind closed doors a little bit. You know, we boxed him internationally earlier on the cards, and I think that's really done him well. But he's getting opportunities. You know, he's out here on this show again, and he's got to make the most of it. And, and you know, Conor Ben, Chris Eubank Jr. the same. None of them had impressive amateur careers. They all got the opportunities off their name. It is harder to become established within your own right, but you've got to take the rough with the smooth and, and ultimately you're going to be under pressure and you're going to be put on the big stage because people are going to want to watch you fight and some are going to watch you fail. You took the words out of my mouth when you said uh, about him fighting, I think it was in Bilbao and a couple of the others and, and fighting out here and I think that really does take the pressure off of Campbell because all eyes are on him back home but when he's abroad like you've just alluded it's, it's not the same sort of pressure what is the plan for Campbell I mean how far I mean is the central area title something like that yeah you've got Jimmy first as the central is area that, champion yeah. I think I think that you know even when you watch him now training and going through the, 
the motions with Matthew Hatton. You see, you see a different fighter. I think you see a fighter that, that has improved technically. Now we're watching him on pads. Always remember that first day when he came over and just gassed himself out on the pads. Yeah, I know. And also yeah. gassed himself out in Gibraltar. Yeah. Do you remember over four rounds? I mean, but there's a huge amount of pressure on his shoulders. But I feel like this is a young man that, you know, needs time but also he's getting all the experience he needs and all the opportunities he needs. So I think that realistically 2023 is about moving up the rounds, eight rounds, moving towards area title levels, moving towards English eliminators. I see him still two years away from fighting for a British title, you know? And, and, and still, that's an impressive level to get to. You know, just because his old man went and boxed Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao, I don't mean automatically he's going to follow suit. Not so everyone's ceiling is the same. No. But, you know, he has ability. There is a huge amount of pressure on him every time he steps in the ring. But I like what I'm seeing. You know, with his development in the ring, even uh, even watching him right now, speaking to him, seeing him just calm down and experience it all. He, he's experienced a lot in the last couple of years, and he's put him in great stead to go on and improve. He's in against uh, Dennis Bartok from Rakovic in the Czech Republic. He's got a mixed record, nine and five, but of those nine, he's stopped six opponents I was talking to his uncle Matthew just not the, the pad off bit and he said uh, quite wild Bartosz comes to really fight and, and he believes that will suit Campbell Hatton I think some of the more equipped journeymen who know to have stuff on and survive have been kind of awkward for and you want somebody that's going to open up and, and let the hands go against him yeah look, I think uh, what I've noticed being out in the States a, f a few times and watching the journeymen out there they're different to what we have they back, are really back home they, they really tend to go in their shell survive so they can fight next week uh, that doesn't help you as a fighter I don't feel uh, it's very hard to sort of unlock the, the, the puzzle that's in front of you so for Campbell to have a opponents that are firing back making him think about what's coming back and they will obviously leave themselves open so yeah match matching Campbell is important that they they get somebody that is going to let the hands go uh, but we've got to remember he's still learning Kane, Hatton, the undefeated man Kunian. he's in action on Saturday night at the Etihad Arena here in Abu Dhabi so Campbell Hatton is uh, third up on the bill, on Before the Bell Saturday afternoon. Just going to come and sit in the studio with us uh, while well, Akib Fiaz uh, and I think Sultan al Nuimi is actually going to get into the ring. Let's get Sultan al Nuimi into the ring and then we'll have a chat with, uh, with Campbell. Here's David. Our next fight, eight round super flyweights. We've got another undefeated gentleman from Dubai here in the UAE. At this time, please welcome 8 0, oh, five knockouts from Dubai, UAE. Ladies and gentlemen, Sultan Al Nuaymi. Nuaymi. So, one of the three Emirati prospects on the card, Sultan Al Nuaymi, looking to go 9 0 oh against uh, Jose Sant from Macau in, ex in Ecuador on Saturday night. That will finish things off on uh, Before the Belt. And when he goes through his routine, let's have a chat with Campbell Hatton. I think he's caught his breath after that pad routine. This is a bit different, isn't it, mate? Yeah, it's been a mad week, really. It's been like a little holiday. Yeah, not bad at all. Um, you've had three fights this year, and you have five uh, in your first year as a pro. A little bit more time in between fights just to kind of work on your craft and spend a little bit more time in the gym. Yeah, and um, I think coming into this one, we're like, we've seen the gradual improvements and We've been coming away pleased that, that we've performed, performed better, but we know there's still a lot a lot more that I'm capable of, and we're going to show it this time. I've, uh, like I've, I've got into a bit of a habit where I started the fights perfectly the last few, first half, and then uh, slowly crept back into like just focusing on volume and getting a bit scrappy and just going in tear-up mode a little bit. So made a conscious effort this time around to try and get rid of it completely. I'm going to have to start calling you the road warrior, I think. You've been, was it Bilbao, Gibraltar, and now Abu Dhabi? It's not bad, is it? Yeah. It's, it's not bad at all. Do you feel a sense of release from the pressure when you're fighting abroad? You know, obviously a huge name back home. Do you feel a little bit at ease when you're away from home? Yeah, like this week, it's been probably one of the biggest shows I've been on still, but been the most relaxed I've been. Like, I had an hour around the pool before, sunbathing. Me and Matt need yeah, it anyway, don't we? On you. <laughs> we need it, but um, yeah, just dead relaxed. I've not got the pressure of wanting to impress people back home. Like, 
have people, friends and family coming to watch. I can just concentrate on the job, but this time round, I'm just going to uh, look to show off the more skillful side that we know we know I'm capable of. Yeah. Um, I was chatting to Matthew and obviously seeing Jamie Moore's team out here, I know I know him and uh, your uncle get on well, and I kind of thought, I wonder if you and Akib be as a, a sparred together. And of course, you were at Northside together in the very early days. Did you do much sparring? Do you think you might do a little bit of sparring with, with Akib next year? That would make a bit of sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, we was going to do it this time, but cir circumstances meant that things kept coming up. But yeah, sparred Akib when we was both at Northside, obviously a long time ago, that, so... Um, I was, I was about 15, I think he was about 16, so it'd be good to uh, get a few more few more rounds in here, because I think it'd be uh, top-class rounds. And we were talking about just the, your options for next year, maybe a central area, Jimmy first, beat Justin Newell in, in a couple of rounds to become the new central area lightweight champion. that be a sort of fight that would maybe be of interest to you at some point next year, if you're going to take a step up central area, that'd be a good place to start, do you think? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, obviously, the... The, the road they want to go down, I'll leave to my team. But I think the uh, I think that them them type of fights are definitely within my reach next year. And 100% uh, I'm looking to pick up a title of some sort. Good man. Well, we look forward to seeing you on uh, Saturday night, Campbell. Yes, uh, thanks mate. very much for for joining us, mate. Yeah, and we'll Campbell, thanks, off, mate. and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Cheers. So Campbell Hatton will be in action against Dennis Bartos from uh, Raknovic in the Czech Republic. He's uh, a bit of a handful. Campbell Hatton's an opponent, can bang a little bit. Six of his uh, eight wins have come by way of knockout yeah. and he comes to fight as well. Yeah, he's uh, he's one of those, when he lets his hands go, he really commits to the shot. There's pluses uh, uh, and negatives to that. You know, you can, if you hit your opponent, really hurt them. But if you miss with a shot, you expose yourself and there are openings. I think it's important for Campbell to keep the shots nice and, nice and straight. What I've enjoyed watching Campbell's, imp well, the improvements that I've seen are He's snapping the shots out more as opposed to pushing the shots out. Um, there's more thought behind his work. So I think intelligent boxing, don't do anything silly. Keep the shots nice and straight. They'll get to the, the opponent quicker than the opponent's shots will. Like I say, the big wide hook. So it's another step for Campbell Hatton to keep improving. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, clap your hands out here. Sultan al Noemi, undefeated. There we go, DJ's into it. Undefeated from Dubai, super flyweight, super fly. This whole card is super fly. It's the beginning of our champion series here in Abu Dhabi, UAE. Again, sponsored by Palm Sports, Stage Front, and Wow Hydrate. Brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing, telecast live around the world exclusively on the zone. We'll be back in just a couple minutes with our next fighter. Okay, um, so we've just seen uh, Campbell Hatton and Sultan Al Nuaimi undefeated super flyweight uh, with five knockouts, with eight wins, two-time national champion. Looking forward as part of one of the three Emiratis on the bill uh, on the undercard to showing what they have got on Saturday night. Uh, we'll be shortly seeing Akhil Fiasco through his open workout. And he's just getting himself uh, ready, but. Let's talk about this main event. Do you want to? Sorry, I'm having in? to creep in here. Like I'm 40 really... years old and my ears are starting to go. Yeah, it's very what, loud here. My ears are fine and it's unusual I can't hear you, mate. So, um, <laughs> I guess for, for both of these fighters, this is the fight that can kind of put them. Well, for Gilberto Ramirez, the fight that can really put him on the map. He's had as many fights as he's had, but the criticism of him is that. There's always been a caveat to a lot of these oppositions. Some have been a little bit past the prime, fringe world level guys. He's had some very, very good fights. But for Dimitri Bibol, a lot of people that I don't think were too high on him before the Canelo fight, but the, the crowd has firmly shifted in his favour. Everybody's high on Dimitri Bibol. He is consensus number one or two, depending on which way you look at it with Artur Viterbiev. But for, for the pair of them, this fight it is, a, is a huge sort of notch on their on their legacy. Isn't it? It's it's as big as it gets for me right now because look, I'm not getting too carried away with the Canelo victory, right? We called that. Back, no, no, we basically called it, and you certainly because you're very vocal about it. Got a lot, it. Got a lot of that, stick yeah. on Twitter, but we did the tactic show, and you've got to remember, Bibble is a, naturally a lot bigger than Canelo. He's a naturally bigger man. But what what I do take away from that victory is his ability to handle the big occasion, the pressure going into that fight. You know. I, I was very impressed with it. He grabbed the fight by the scruff of the neck. 
early on and he said, look, I'm the bigger man, I'm the better man and I'm going to prove it. And he did. For me, against Ramirez, I can exactly, exactly what you said there. Ramirez kind of untested in comparison to Bibble. He's a very good fighter, but we don't quite know how good. Um, for me, I just lean towards Bibble. I think the, the feet, well, when I say lean towards Bibble, I think he'll win comfortably on points, if I'm honest, but I do feel there's going to be patches where it's going to be very, very entertaining. I could talk about this all night long. I'm really, really intrigued by this fight. Well, we will talk about it a little bit later on, and we will talk about it uh, over the next couple of days as well. Dimitri Bevel, who became the man who beat the man earlier on this year. Canelo has fought 18 different world champions. Only Floyd Mayweather has beaten him. I think, really, the, the Canelo Bivol fight was about the challenge of the weight. But Dimitri Bivol is a man that's been talked about in boxing for a long time as someone who's got ability well beyond the opposition that he's faced. And there was always the danger in that fight that this guy was really good. This guy was not just a world champion. This guy was the best in the division. This guy was a pound for pound great. And he went on to prove it on Cinco de Mayo. Biggest moment of Dimitri Bivol's career and he has risen to the occasion thus far. You can see the, the forehead of Canelo getting red in as well. I think Canelo Alvarez, you know, I, I'm sure he had his problems in camp and, and people do, but I think that what we saw was a pound for pound great in Dimitri Bivol, you know, who was just too big and too strong and, and maybe too good on the night for Canelo Alvarez. And, you know, there was a lot of people in boxing that it didn't surprise, but it probably did surprise Team Canelo. <laughs> Canelo is known to take on big challenges, fighting the best. He might have bit off too much than he could chew here tonight. I think the atmosphere, you know, when people realized that Canelo Alvarez was in a real fight, it was bubbling. And then as the fight progressed and Dimitri Bivol started to run away from the fight, it was depressing for the Mexican fans. You know, Dimitri silenced them and, and really uh, used his size and his skill to, to win rounds and dominate the fight against Canelo Alvarez. And always staying in control, not giving up control. Whoa. Stop! Yeah, he's frustrated. Vamos, Saul, vamos! Tu puedes, Saul, tu puedes, tu puedes! look at the reaction of Dimitri Bivol after the fight, it really says this didn't surprise me. You know, ice running through this man's veins. I don't think his pulse rate really ever changes. He's ice cold, he's a dangerous man and he's ready for all comers. He's still I think what Dimitri Bivol proved that night is not only is he a pound for pound great, but in my opinion, he's the number 175 pounder in the world. Of course, he wants to be undisputed. A fight with Artur Betebiev is also dawning, but right now, faces arguably one of the toughest tests of his career in Zerdo Ramirez, a true 175 pounder, former world super middleweight champion, undefeated as well, who wants to create his own legacy in the sport and beat a pound for pound great in Dimitri Bivol. WBA Life Heavyweight! Champion of the world, Dimitri Bivol. It's interesting. I mean, on one hand, Canelo Alvarez wants Zerdo to win for Mexico. On the other hand, Canelo probably wants Bivol to win because he wants to make sure he gets his hands on him for the rematch. And Bivol must win to land that Canelo Alvarez rematch. And maybe he'll want to go on and fight for Undisputed as well. But Zerdo may be looking for the victory to push his own narrative for a Canelo Alvarez fight. So, so much in play on so many levels. I think this is the perfect fight to kick off the Champion Series. You know, a true epic matchup at 175 pounds, a pound for pound great in Dimitri Bivo against a fantastic undefeated fighter in Zerdo Ramirez. Such an important fight for the division, such an important fight for boxing. A huge undercard with plenty of world championship action. And as I said, the perfect way to kick off the Champion Series in Abu Dhabi.
Well, what a night that was for Dimitri Bivol, cementing himself as one of the best fighters on the planet, pound for pound. No, well, we talked about you know, us calling the win, and I think people were, were surprised in the build-up to, to the fight. But I think maybe it says a little bit more about how little people have watched of Dimitri Bivol, given how good he is. And, and maybe he hasn't had the opposition that have set the world alight as well. So for him, we, we talked about this being Gilberto Ramirez's opportunity, but Ramirez has a big fan base too. For, for Dimitri Bivol, if he wants to secure that unification with Arta Baturbi, having become undisputed at light heavyweight, this is, although not, not a world title for him to be gained by this, he's got to defend his belt, and it's not, not an easy defence. This puts, uh, uh, I suppose, extra emphasis on him and Baturbiev being the fight to make at light heavyweight. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it, it, it's huge. It really is. It, it's a massive fight. Um, but both fighters, you've just got to see them around the hotels, etc. We see them yesterday. They're extremely focused at the fight at hand. They're, they're very experienced fighters now. This is, this is for me, a huge test for Ramirez. It really is. I mean, th this is, we will find out how good this man is. Well, that's top of the bill, of course. WBA World Light Heavyweight title on the line. Dimitri Bivol defending the belt against Gilberto Ramirez. Plenty of action on the undercard. The final fight uh, on before the bell. Uh, we just saw him work out Sultan Anu But Akib Fiaz now ready to go through his uh, open workout. So let's hand you over to David to bring him into the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, the official open workout continues here from Yasmal, Yaz Island, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates for a big show taking place here on Saturday night. That's all being brought to you courtesy of Matt's Room. And our next fighter making his way up to the stage right now and to the ring. He's from Oldham, Lancashire, England. He's undefeated as a professional, 9-0. Please welcome Akib Fiaz. Fiaz. His trainers, Jamie and Nigel. All right, so David uh, Diamante re referenced Jamie and Nigel there. Jamie Moore, of course. Former uh, British light middleweight champion. Nigel Travis. Jamie's PA. <laughs> but what a brilliant training team that they have been for this young man. Jamie Moore, 2018, I think he was. He was looking for kind of high-paced, aggressive young fighter to prepare. Carl Frampton for what ended up being just about fight of the year in 2018. And they found this man, young Akin Fiaz, and they were so impressed after the first few spars. But they decided to, to keep him on. Frampton since has hung him up. He's talked about just what a good young man he is. And uh, well, he's had a very, very difficult 18 months, he lost uh, his mum and his best friend within the space of about 10 days, both to, to COVID, a uh, bolt out of the blue. And as such, he had a bit of time off last year, uh, as we would fully expect. He's been just trying to get life together, but he's dealt with it for a man of his age unbelievably well, Darren. He's, he's come back looking in good spirits and good health. Um, and a couple of kind of shake the rust off fights and, and another one for him on Saturday night. It's great to see him back again. Obviously, being a boxing promotion, we're talking about fighters, how good they are, who they're fighting next, wins, defeat. But we don't always get to talk about the, the personality of the fighters. Akeb Fears is one of the nicest folks you could wish to meet. 100%. What a lovely bloke he is. Honestly, a really, really top man. Lovely spending time with him. And seeing how much he enjoys this sport and how much he enjoys doing this. I say this all the time, and we understand this, so, this is so important, but it's about being active and being busy. And he wants to now really get on a roll of fighting frequently. What I love about Akeb is he's very accomplished on the back foot, fighting and boxing uh, sensibly from that great pedigree that he has. But I like him in the pocket also. When he's up yeah. close, the way he slides uppercuts in and he disguises them very well. He, you know, he puts the hook on the end of them. He'll step to the side. He'll avoid shots coming back to him. He, he's got a bit of everything. I think there's still it, time for him to be able to sit down the shots a little bit more. I feel there. Is, is power there that we've yet to see. Um, but I'm, I'm a big fan of him personally and as a fighter. Yeah, he was back out last time out for his uh, ninth fight and ninth win against Jordan Ellison, tough man Jordan Ellison. It was a mini step up for Fiaz because he'd won a, a Northern Area title at light welterweight last November. He was in good form and he gave Fiaz a little bit to think about 
early on in the fight. The Fias pressured him, put his shots together really well in close, counter punched on the front foot, as you mentioned, just punching off those little slips and dips. Just grounding down to a really good points victory. And as I mentioned, it's been a, a steady reintroduction back into the ring after just a, a horrendous and unthinkable 18 months for the young man from Oldham. Nigel Travis, of course, was a, a very good amateur boxer in his day. He's been part of the, the National Fire Service in the UK for, well, I don't know how long here. I want to say over 25 years, but it could even be longer than that, although he might not, he might not thank me for saying that. But there's a little story about Nigel Travis that a few of you who are watching in the, state, in the UK will know. Make sure you like choose that. the right one. I uh, will, yeah. There's a few. Not those ones. He, uh, in their local community, wanted to kind of take a few kids off, off the street, try and improve the, the local area. And in a, a big kind of back storage room in the fire uh, station, they set up a gym without asking for permission from their superiors because I think they knew they'd be turned down because the proof needed to be in the pudding. Set up and after about six to eight months, they had a group of 20, 25 kids in there training regularly. And said eventually decided to kind of speak to his fire chief and say look I want to show you something brought him into this makeshift gym and he went what the hell is this and well this is now I guess probably somewhere between 15 and 20 years on Connor Tudsbury became their first fighter I think he's now the number one lightweight on the GB Olympic squad and will be pushing for a place big time for Paris uh, 2024 at light heavyweight and that's all thanks to the work that Nigel's done from the Mossside Fire Station Boxing Club so not only is this man an excellent trainer Jamie Moore's partner in crime they do an enormous amount of work with underprivileged kids in the community through the fire service and uh, now he's hung the uh, hung the hose up full time as it were and he's, he's going to be head of the Mossside Fire Station Boxing Club running that full time so just an example if you need a reminding of the kind of story and the kind of work that boxing does in, in local communities in the UK but all over the world really. it is brilliant mate and it just shows oh, you how important yeah, boxing is not just for uh, I mean it Olympic changes Olympic kids lives changes their lives England. nice to see everybody out here great fight card championship series it's happening here in Abu Dhabi at the Etihad Arena here he comes brought to you by Mr. Eddie is. Hearn of Matchroom Boxing that were sponsored by Palm Sports. I see, yeah, sorry, room. I don't know what that. I don't know. Is Eddie Hearn or some water or what? JD Sports. Who knows? Um, we're just going to uh, hand over to David uh, shortly the to bring I mean, Khalid Yafai no, into the ring. First fight of the night. Alicia Baumgarten out here. Alicia Baumgarten. Alicia. Great to see you, ladies and gentlemen. World champion right there. Unified world champ. And our next fighter making his way to the state ten rounds in the bantamweight division. His professional record. 26 victories, one defeat. He has 15 wins coming by way of knockout. He fights out of Birmingham, England. He's a 2008 Olympian and the former WBA Super Flyweight Champion of the World. Please welcome Cal Yafai. Yafai. Clap your hands out there. Let's wake up. Look alive, people. All right, there we go. Well, it's great to have uh, Kao Yafai back, the former British Commonwealth and world champion who, in just over a three-year period, won six consecutive world title fights before, before running into one of the all-time legends in modern boxing, Roman Gonzalez Chocolatito. And unfortunately, after a brilliant firefight, he really played his part in that scrap. He was stopped in the ninth round. But after a couple of years off, that was just before the pandemic, He's returning to action. His brother in that time, of course, Kalal Yafai, Olympic gold medalist, has made his way into the professional ranks and is being fast-tracked. But I'm looking forward to seeing what this man has still got to offer in, I think, is going to be the 118-pound division. So while Kalal Yafai goes through his paces and gets back to, to action for the first time in uh, a couple of years, let's have a chat to Akif Fiaz, mate. It's so good to see you, and we've, we've been singing your praises, uh, as always. Just give us an idea uh, of... We're, we're talking about Jamie and I. Nigel, all the good work they do in the community. What have they done for, for your life over the last four years, Jamie and, and Nigel and the team that you've been with? Um, you know what, away from boxing, them guys are like my family. Um, I've been through a lot recently and, and them guys, if, if it wasn't for them, I can genuinely say, I don't know if I would still be boxing. I'm not just boxing, I don't know where I'd be, you know. Yeah. It was in a really dark place, but the family sort of atmosphere we have in the gym, the way every, they care for everyone, you know, 
it's just they're amazing people and, and I'm, I'm just thinking one example Nigel runs Moss Side Fire Station where yeah. he does that times times 100 Jamie does the same over in Walkden they're just great people to be around I know sorry I was about to say a, a lot of coaches don't get that respect I don't think not, not from the fight so much, but the, uh, I don't think people understand how important of a, a, a part they play as far as mentors are concerned. Like Tony Sims is certainly a mentor for me outside of the ring, but I was just going to go now onto a tactical side of things. How important and what have you been working on with Jamie in the gym? I know you want to be active now, you want to be busy, and you're improving very, very well. What has been going on in the gym that we haven't been seeing? Um, I, I'm learning loads. I feel like over the last 10 fights I've had now, with this will be my 10th on Saturday, I've learned every single fight, something new. And Jamie's all about me having, not not hard, hard fights, but tougher fights than most prospects. Yeah. And I feel like I'm getting to, I'm getting to, I'm more comfortable under the lights now, these big events. Um, and Jamie's just sort of, sort of had me fights where I'm learning every single fight and every fight I've took something from it, yeah. And I know you uh, you have been sparring Chantel Cameron, who uh, has got a huge night, the, the biggest night of her career on Saturday night. Um, talk to me about how many how many kind of rounds are you doing? She said you um, she said there was one point a few a couple of weeks ago. She thought you might have knocked one of her teeth out, so she went to check it, and then you gave her a dig in the ribs. I said, what's going on here? <laughs> you know what? That makes me sound really bad, doesn't it? But I swear, <laughs> yeah. I promise you. You know, sparring Chantel, you think, oh, she's a woman and whatever, but. I have to put some shots, put, put a bit into my shots because she, she genuinely is a beast. She she punches two minutes non-stop, and, and you, you've got to be on it. And, and Nigel had me doing five-minute rounds, so I was sparring her two minutes, had with Nigel one minute, and then sparred again for two minutes. So I had to, you know, getting grilled. Yeah, yeah. So it was tough, tough work. Just quickly from me. What is the plan for you for next year, Akib? Is it about being busy? Is it some sort of titles? Um, look, I know activity is the most important thing, but I'm surely you want to start pushing on now, don't you? I mean, by, by the summer, you're going to be looking at some sort of title? Yeah, 100%, um, definitely. I've had, I've had three fights this year from June, um, so in only six months, really. Activity is there now, and I feel like you'll start seeing the best version of me. Yeah. And like you said, right, by summertime next year. Tell you five, clap your hands, ladies and gentlemen. Tell you five. All right. Former WBA super flyweight world champion, Kali Jaffai there. Um, Akib, wish you all the very best on Saturday. Thanks for joining us. Cheers, mate. All the best, mate. Thank you. Cheers. On Saturday night. Well, this is a familiar face. It's a very familiar face, but not one that we've seen for, oh, well, we see him time. around a lot, but it's <laughs> yeah. really, really nice because I know from a couple of the chats that we've had the last uh, couple of years, you, you, you've been looking for dates, but there's a lot of uncertainty as to when you're going to be back. I, I know, you know, it's always difficult sitting on a, on a defeat for any fighter. You then had the pandemic that you had to sit out for, for a year, 18 months. How has life been for, for Kari Afai? How are you, mate? All good, thank you. All good. Oh, I'm sorry. Good yeah, to see all good. You. So talk to me about what's, what's been going on. Obviously, you've been watching Galau rise to, to Olympic superstardom off a brilliant campaign in Tokyo. I know you're one of his biggest supporters and all three of you do support each other as well. Um, but how have you been feeling about, about your career and, and what sort of process have you been through the last couple of years? Yeah, good. Uh, obviously, after after last box back in 2020, come back, pandemic come. Um, Obviously, I plan to have a good break afterwards. You know, I spoke to Eddie after, All right. after the last one. And fight. now making his way to the ring, Eddie please welcome the break. challenger. We're we'll going against Cal Yufai. Um, 10 rounds for the WBC International Flyweight then, Championship. Obviously, I put, I put on a lot of weight Gomez, over, uh, over the pandemic. Mexico, please welcome. Um, Go ahead. And then I had a few issues in my personal life as well. But, it's 12-1-1 one one yeah, with one I'm, one I'm, just, I'm just in a good place now. I'm happy. Um, I've had a long time to train. I've been training non-stop for the past what, year and a half. Um, I've been I've been away training, so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm back and I'm, I'm happy to be back. Have you done much reflecting on on your last fight? Look, you was in there with a legend, you know, yeah. a, a current legend, if you like. It was a hell of a fight, by the it, way. It was a hell of a fight. You weren't yeah. out of the fight. It's just an unbelievable fight, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, yeah, it? Yeah, do, do you think do you think tactically you'd approach it differently if you had the opportunity again? Um, you know what, I never look back and, and think, you know what, I wish I'd done this. If everything happened to a reason, I leave that in God's hands, that's it. Um, everything's written and I'll just crack on with it. 
the past is the past. I take it as an experience. I learn. Um, obviously, I learned the hard way, but I just know that I knew obviously, you know, I had to I had to rest, I had to recover, I had to move up in weight, which is the most important thing for me. Um, but taking nothing away from Roman Gonzalez is an unbelievable fire, unbelievable fire. And um, yeah, it's just obviously it's mad how you get wrote enough as a fighter after one defeat, especially to a pound pound legend. Um, but you know, I just crack on my career. I've had it, I've had an unbelievable career. If, if somebody had told me ten years six, ago, six back to back world title victories, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not many British fighters can, can say that. But right? if somebody said to me ten years ago, this is what I was going to achieve, at, you know, at this point, I would have bit their hand off. But there's more. I want yeah. more. The fire's there. I want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starving for success. And does it excite you as well now at 118? Obviously, when you're a little bit older, let the body expand by three pounds. It's not a lot, but it just gives you that little one percent breathing space. With, with the potential of, I know Paul Butler's got the, the task of his, his life against Naoya in a way. I think the expectation is in a way will, will be victorious in that fight and then move up to 122. That then splinters four belts at 118 pounds. Now. I know you'll be out of the rankings because you've been out of action for a couple of years, but if you were to string two or three decent wins together, you've got one of the best promoters in the game. Surely they can get you into a good position to, to maybe fight for a world title in the next yeah. 18 months. How does that How does that make you feel? Like The main thing for me is I concentrate on one fight at a time, as always. I've always been that kind of guy. I'm, I know how the game works. I know, you know, you take your eye off the ball for a split second, it can all come crashing down. Yeah. Darren knows that, you know what I mean? Like, you experience, you know it. And... For me, just getting that out of the way and then see what's next. I'm sure, you know, you know, I've worked with Eddie all my whole career. I'm sure he can get me a world title fight whenever he wants, really. Um, don't want to look too far, sorry for back in there. Don't want to look too fast Saturday. I guess first off, yeah. what do you know about your opponent? Um, and if all goes well Saturday, I know Chris mentioned three fights there. In your head, how many fights would you like in the rebuilding process before you have one of those big fights? I think the main thing for me is just see how I perform on Saturday and how I look, how I feel. I think how I feel is the main thing. Um, if everything's cool, I feel good, then get me the next, you know, if I, if I can get a world title shot the fight after, great. Probably I'll be hard, but if it's a final eliminator or something, great. Um, obviously, I want, I want to be a world champion. I was world champion for such a long time. And I just got used to being world champion. Yeah. I want that. I don't want nothing else. I was gonna. That was. I was. What I was gonna ask you because you're sitting next to a two-time European champion. He never lets me forget it either. But <laughs> um, obviously, look, there's, there's some kind of beatable opposition at British and, and European level, and coming up in weight. So there's there's no there's no sort of plan to, to just kind of go back half a level, just get some experience, maybe European level, and then go back up just to kind of oil the wheels again after two years. You want to get straight back in the deep. Yeah, yeah, no, no, European level, nothing there, no. Forget that. Okay. <laughs> I, and I mean, it's going to be a race to the top between you and Galau, his opponent. Uh, going Garcia Rodriguez he's uh, in the ring there there he is giving us a thumbs up in the Superman gear and uh, I mean he's going to hopefully give your brother the, right, the round that he needs on Saturday night nice but round of applause. It's the challenger for the we're WBC talking about Galau possibly fighting for a world title at the back end of, of next year what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. Is he ready? Great to see you brother I think so but back end of next year 100% and, and his opponent. Um, but like now he's he's just like me, he's just, you know, the ring. concentrate on one fight at a time and just, just get this guy out of the way first and then, the uh, and then move champion. on from there. His professional record 2-0 oh, with two knockouts from Birmingham, England. He is the 2020 Olympic gold medalist and the reigning, defending, undefeated WBC international flyweight champion, Galal Yafai. Yafai. He's just so cool with it as well. He's what? He's just so cool with it as well. Yeah, you, you'd never know the kind of pressure that he's under or he's been under the last uh, year, 18 months. Deals with everything cool as ice. And when well, he got that Olympic opportunity in Rio 2016, quite late notice really, wasn't it? I yeah, suppose yeah, yeah. he came on to, to the squad quite late, took Harvey Horn's kind of long-standing number one spot, the, the former European silver medalist Harvey Horn, and then ended up in Rio, came up against the Cuban at the Olympic Games, and you know how difficult that is, hitting one of the Cubans, but when he came up against uh, Zar Galagos in uh, 2020, what a, what a performance that was, wasn't it? Oh yeah, unbelievable. It is a rematch. And from the, uh, from the World Championships. Yeah. So, um, you know, people going, he's never going to beat the Cuban. No one beats Cuban. And I was thinking, well, he boxed him last year and he beat him. 
So, but no, obviously, you know, a lot of people don't get to see, you know, world championships and things like that, so they don't know. But what a performance it was um, against the Cuban in the Olympics. Uh, Yusfani Vaisha, sorry, I had uh, Argelagos on the brain. Yusfani Vaisha, yeah, who's uh, always like a 200 bout world champion, uh, three-time world medalist on three Pan American Games medals as well. So, I mean, a proper, proper fighter, but he came out like a bull, didn't it? Stuck it right on him. and. I think you have to with, with the Cubans. If they get in any sort of rhythm, it's very hard to get them out of it. Yeah, of course. And that's what they're not used to that, them Cubans. They're not used to having someone just, you know, basically put it on them and just rush them. They need space, they need time. And, um, you know, Galau just, Galau just walked, walked straight through. Once he won that, was that the point where you thought, yeah, he's going to win the he's gonna win the tournament? Now? Yeah, because I knew it was for the medal. I thought, this is it now. He needs to get. He needs to win this spot, the hardest spot for the medal, and then. But obviously, the, the next two are tough as well. He had the Kaza. Um, uh, Kaza yeah, Bibosimov. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. unbelievable. He, he yeah. won the world championships after that. Yeah, he did, didn't he? Yeah. A year later, yeah. So, and then uh, the Filipino beat the reigning Olympic champion. Like and, the, the people he had to beat, the five that he had to go through to become Olympic champion, absolutely unbelievable. There was no, um, there was no Val Barker trophy for the first time in Tokyo because uh, Aiba, I think, were on that sort of band. So I think we can award him the Dal Barker trophy. Dal Barker, yeah, that's it. That's his. The first no bias here, no corruption, <laughs> no cash back handers here. No way, no way. Yeah, I don't know if I've asked you the questions, Cal. If you have, I apologise for not remembering, but. Do you spar with each other? Yeah, we, spoke, we, we had our last spar last week, done 10 rounds together. Really? Yeah. And I, look, it's going to be hard because I guess you're going to be biased, but from your point of view, being in there with some of the best, whether it be sparring or fighting, how does Galau com uh, compare to some of those? Yeah, to some of the guys well, so some of the best that you've been in with, oh, yeah. where does he reign? Yeah, he's got up there. Um, yeah. The only thing the other guys have on him is size. Right. But, like, obviously, with his bar, He's like, technically, he's, he don't show his, like, his full, but, you know, his yeah. technical ability. Um, he is technically very smart, and he knows how to, you know, when to go, when not to go, when to throw power shots, when not to throw power shots. He's very, very, uh, very gifted. And heavy-handed as well, so I hear. Heavy-handed for a little man, too. He carries some pop. He carries some pop. <laughs> you don't like to give your brothers too much credit, do you? Yeah, he did. He had us on uh, on the edge of our seats out in Tokyo, delayed by over a year. And of course, he was one of two that qualified. I think Peter McGrail was uh, was the other one. Thanks very much for your time, Cal. We look forward to seeing you back in action on Saturday. We're going to replace one Yafai brother for uh, uh, the other. Galal Yafai right here, undefeated international champion, defending his title on Saturday night at the Etihad Arena here in Abu Dhabi. Down comes the uh, Commonwealth Games champion, Olympic gold medalist. But before we uh, talk to Galau Yafai, let's just hand back to David to get the next fighters in the ring, and then we'll uh, we'll come back and have a word with our. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the open workout champion. continues, and we now come to the first of our three world title contests. Twelve rounds for the IBF Super Featherweight Championship of the world, and it pits number two in the world versus number one in the world. It is a vacant title. Right now, making his way up to the stage for the open workout, his professional record, 28 victories, one defeat. He has 16 wins coming by way of knockout. He's the former IBF Intercontinental Champion and the reigning Commonwealth and European Super Featherweight Champion. Please welcome Zelfa Brown Flash Barrett. Barrett. One opportunity. This is for Zelfa Barrett. He had one eye on Joe Cordina's challenge against Kenichi Agawa in the summer. He was on the undercard where he won the European title against Farouk Korbanov in what was the performance of his career so far. And he knew he was 
sitting in a very, very strong position for that world title. Cordina, of course, with yet another hand injury has been stripped of the title. He will get first dibs of the winner between Zelfa Barrett and Shabkat Rakimov, who was Joe Cordina's mandatory. A dangerous fight for him on Saturday night. We'll talk about this with him in a few moments' time where he goes through his workout. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Galau Yafai now in the studio uh, with us, mate. Another one, three, uh, three fights uh, this year, your third on Saturday night, and of course rescheduled from four weeks ago. Saw you sitting in the hotel lobby after Ben Yee Bank and everything that happened that week, and must be, I, I suppose every fighter at some point goes through almost to the point they made weight and then a late, uh, a late pull out. How was, how was that for you? How the last four weeks been for you? Yeah, it was hard. Um, obviously, getting the news right at the beginning, obviously, it was hard. I was prepared to fight. Um, but yeah, I just, it is what it is. That's my mindset. It is what it is. Uh, I've got opportunity here. And on Saturday, I'll just take it and, and fight. I would normally fight and get a nice win. I'm just talking to your brother, of course. Been out the ring for about two years now. I said you've been, you've been sparring with him. How nice is it to be finally sharing a, a professional car with him? I bet you never thought you'd see the day, did you? I know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm used to normally seeing Gamal and Kyle sharing cards, and I think Gamal's over there a bit jealous. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, now, hopefully, in the future, we can we can all share a card. But now it's good with Kyle. He, he's, he's someone we've all looked up to, me and, me and Gamal. Um, so now to find a card him is brilliant. Uh, uh, look, you've been incredible so far. I just wanted to ask, how have you found the transition, not just from a, a, a boxing side of things, but Going from the amateurs to the professional, how have you found it? You know what, it is different, but I've tried to keep everything similar. I, I, I know I know it's hard to, um, but as an amateur, thank God I was successful. Um, I've got to try and keep the same attitude. Obviously the training's different, um, things like that, more people watch. Um, but I've got to try and keep everything similar, but just, just be better. I'm sure you're going to ask this question probably more articulate way than I would. But look, every, I guess the big question is, you're one of those you know, Olympic gold medalists and you cracked right on 10 rounders, etc. What is the plan moving forward? Look, I know you're too professional to, to overlook Saturday, but what is the plan for you? When, when in your... Like in your sights, when are you thinking about potential eliminators and world title shots? You know what, the, Darren? The thing is, I'm actually there's actually not a plan for it in myself. I just take it fight by fight. Um, and I say another day, I don't know whether people are rushing me or it's a compliment. And I think I'm that good yeah. to be fighting for world titles in the future or soon. I've only had two fights, but can I mix it with the world champions? I probably can. No, not being deluded, I probably can. But I want to be in them and I want to win them as well, not just, you know what I mean, compete with them. So I'm sure time will tell. I could look brilliant on Saturday. I could look great. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Let's say we're a year in the future, right? So it's 2023, November. Where would you like to be at? What's your ideal scenario? Um, Probably on the verge of fighting for world title, maybe. Um, but again, it's a, it's a good question. It, it just depends how well I do. Because I, I could fight someone half good, come unstuck, or could fight someone half good and just demolish them. So it, it just depends how I fight. And, and, and I can talk loads, but my fighting, what you're talking. Yeah. Barrett, you'll see his uncle just uh, watching on there. Bottom left of your... Green, Pat Barrett, and Barney talked about how much he respects the man in the opposite corner to him on Saturday night. Freddie Roach, of course, one of the, the Hall of Fame trainers that he was inducted 10 years ago this year as well. And all the great work he's done with so, so many world champions in that time as well. But every trainer has a great night, dreams of a great night. And of course, this could be his with Zelfa Barrett on Saturday. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here out there for the Brown Flash, Zelfa Barrett, ranked number two in the world. He's going for his first world title. Wish him the best of luck from Manchester, 28-1. Hell of a fighter. It's going to be a great fight, and he's going against number one, the number one ranked fighter in the world, who's making his way to the ring right now. He fights out of Korgantuben, Tajikistan. He's the former IBO Super Featherweight World Champion. He's a southpaw. 
and he's undefeated in his campaign as a professional with a record of 16 victories, no defeats, one draw, with 13 of his 16 wins coming by way of knockout. Please welcome at this time, Shavkat Sherhan Rakimov. Rakimov. So he was the, the manager challenger to Joe Cordina after that stunning knockout of Kenichi Agawa in the summer. And of course, with Cordina's injury and him out for the foreseeable, the belt was made vacant and the one and two challengers will meet for the vacant title on Saturday night. And well, we've got one in the ring there, Shafkat Rakimov, under the guidance of Freddie Roach at the famous wildcard gym. And the other half of that brilliant fight is in the studio with itself for Barrett. Well, I remember speaking to you post-fight against Farouk Kobanov in what was, I think you may agree, probably the performance of your career so far. Everything really started to come together and I said, I know you'll have one eye on this main event, but I don't think you'd prepare to do your homework quite as quickly as this and your opportunity to come around quite as quickly, but that's what happens in boxing sometimes. Listen, this is when you, when you live the lifestyle and you, and you live in the gym, this is what happens, you know. Opportunities come. If I feel like I wasn't ready, I wouldn't have took it because I believe I was getting this opportunity anyway. Rank number two, I was getting a fight in December, um, called main event, Josh Warrington, and then that would have been my next fight, the winner, of, the winner of this. So, you know, it's going to happen, but I believe in myself and I live in the gym and I'm a fit. Mr. Darren, I've got a question for you. He's fought five times in the last couple of years, two really good 12-rounders, Bruno Torimo, who's an absolute bull, and Farouk Kobanov, of course. So those 24 rounds of activity, although he's only had a six-week camp, the activity and the, and the fighting regularly at, at a good level, that's surely more important in preparation oh, for a fight key. like this. It's, it's absolutely key, your time and your distance with quality fighters. He's crucial in a, in a fight like this. Look, Rakamov's no mug, we know he's a very good fighter, but you've got to beat good fighters with world titles, I'm sure you're aware of that. Not giving too much away, and, and, and I guess for, for us who know, it, it's probably not rocket science, but how do you beat Rakamov? What's the plan? To box his head off. Yeah. That's, you know, when it's, if you know boxing, you know styles make fights and, um, you know, he comes forward, he throws a lot of punches and, you know, but I believe his style's made for me, man. You know, and he, he's not going to all of a sudden be like Lomo, is he? And be like, just trick yourself or, you know, he's going to be coming forward. He, he believes in his power. So, you know, and he's, he's a good fighter, but at this level, everyone's a good fighter. I, I honestly believe Rakimov will bring the best out of you. And the reason I've said this, you know, when I've done some interviews in the build-up to this fight, I've mentioned that you, you're such a laid-back individual. And I, I, I like to think I am in some respects, and a lot of fighters who are laid-back sometimes can bring that personality into the ring. We see it against Donovan, in patches against Martinez, where you just kind of... This is no disrespect, this can happen where you get into that mode where you start coasting and you can switch off a little bit. He, you can't switch no, off from Rakimov, Every single second of every single minute of every single round is going to be on me. He's going to try and try, so I know. I know what I've got to do and I won't, I won't take this fight if I didn't think I can win. I won't take this fight if I thought, you know what, it's too short notice. I've been in the gym, I've been fit, I've been ready, I've been... I was asking Eddie, well, my manager Steve Wood to go over to Eddie to get me a fight before a fight. Because I've been ready, I've been in the gym, so... Yeah, man. He's a multiple-time national champion in Tajikistan, boxer at the 2013 World Championship, 16-0 and 1. 13 knockouts. He's uh, had a front foot counter-punching southpaw. For those of you who haven't seen him, sharp, he's aggressive, heavy-handed, with good timing as well. And after the victory over Azinga Fazili, he joined up with Freddie Roach level his game up even further in. Well, he is dangerous with that left hand. We've seen him switch a couple of fighters off with it, but I think the same thing can be said about you. Listen, right, ladies and gentlemen, vice versa. I've had, I've had 16 knockouts, he's had 16 fights. World, you know, it's, it's done what it's had to do, but when I beat the fighters I've been in the ring with, I think Saturday I would. Night, you know, he's a good fighter, I'm not taking it away from him, but I believe I'll beat him. This is the kind of confidence and, and relaxation you want to see in a fighter ahead of a, a, a big Rhodes night like this. Absolutely, and you, you, you're saying all the right Warmer. things. You can't switch off. Star Wars made fights. You feel he's, he's made for you. House. That's what you want to hear. And also, for me, I'm looking at this, and this is obvious to everybody. There's pot of gold, and then there's big pots of gold. The chance to be a world champion, and then you've got that huge 
fight, whether it be Manchester or Cardiff, against Joe Cordina, it's huge for you, isn't it? Of the world. Becoming a world champion is huge, you know yourself, like, as a child. It gives me a few now, you know what I mean? It's my mum's dream as well as my she dream, so Chicago, why am I going to say no? If I didn't think I was going to win, or I didn't think I was going to be ready, I wouldn't have took it. I know, keep in my heart and my soul. Jessica. Too many things that happen to me in Jess life Kimmel for me not to be where I am I'm, I'm now. Life's about a balance. Mark Bad things can happen to me and not a good thing happen to me. My, my daughter's a blessing regardless, that's whatever. I've got a great family, great missus at home, but something I put my whole life into. I'm getting goofy pimples now because I know, I know, I know, I know it's my time Saturday. And I don't care where he's from, what it looks like, how many knockouts is that, I, 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 I don't care. I just know. In my heart and soul, I can beat this guy. And when and he's, if he walks onto one of my punches, listen, it looks easy on the outside. My style looks easy. It looks like oh, but I, I must have some sort of respectable power. Cause look at Bruno Tuimo. I remember watching him, and I thought, oh my god, this guy doesn't step back. Got in the ring with me, whole different story. And I damaged my hand. So when he was when he was going back, I couldn't really get on him. But listen. Saturday night I'm gonna win. I can talk all day about it, but you know, Saturday night I'm gonna win. <laughs> Baron, I know, I know you'll share this uh, thought. I think the way this young man has dealt with everything that's happened to him in the last year's one will be extremely proud of him. And you also know just what fire fighting for a lost loved one can give you in the most important fight of your life. And if he has to weather a rough patch here or there, it, always, it could be, it could you, be whatever exactly, you're saying. Give me good it, what, it could be what he needs to get through, as it was with you. Well. It just gave me that extra level. I, I didn't know that there was a level you could go beyond, but when you suffer grief, as we have, it just takes you to, to and elevates you to another place. And that doesn't, you know, it helps me because I was hurt in my fight. And it was that, you know, that memory that really got me going. I've no doubt that, you know, there may be times in this fight where it doesn't go your way and he Oops. might come on it, but you can lean on that. You're fighting for something else. It's just... It's a different it, feeling, man. Like, right, even now, I just... I'm laid back, I'm cool, like... I'm ready, man. And I've, like I said, too many bad things happen. My mum's with me now, but... Listen, there's going to be times in this fight where I'm going to have to dig deep and, and... and and do what I've got to do. And that's my edge on these guys, because I think... Listen... You can't hurt me as much as I've been hurt in life, no matter what. So, let's go. And that's my mindset. Was well, for, for both of us, very, very best of luck, and thanks for spending a bit of time chatting to us. Thank you. Good afternoon. We'll see you at the press Thank conference you. Uh, tomorrow. Zelfa Barrett, one half of the IBF Super Featherweight World Title fight on our live card on the zone around the world Saturday night against Shavkat Rakimov. And, well, a man that was a bit unceremoniously to uh, see them hugging in the background there. He's a gracious man, Joe Cordina, after the victory of his career in the summer uh, against Kanichi Agawa. He is, unfortunately, no longer the world champion. Come and sit with us, Joe. We've got Jasper Caskill in the ring, challenging for undisputed super lightweight titles on Saturday night against Chantel Campbell. We'll come on to that in a minute. But Joe, I mean, you're in an unusual position, right? Because what was probably knockout of the year, and I think it, it probably will be as long as the, as the year lasts for the next eight weeks. But you're now having to watch a man and you've very graciously hugged him and wished him well there. Zelfa Barrett challenge for a world title that I know you probably feel you haven't really even lost yet. No, I haven't lost. And you're saying about knockout of the year. I've seen Eddie about three, four times. Someone have had a knockout in the last few months. Oh, that's knockout of the year. Stop talking rubbish, it's not. <laughs> Mine is a knockout of the year. But um, yeah, it's a bit of a bittersweet moment. Um, obviously I won Zelfa to win, but I've got to watch him potentially win a world, my world title. Um, that I've been stripped, I feel wrongly stripped. Um, so yeah. What, what happened in that process out of interest? It's a bit, uh, it's, it, it, I'll, I'll go from start to finish, I'll try and go through as quick as possible. Yeah, please do. I went to um, Eddie's office to sort of sort this out because Rakimov went missing, no one could get hold of him. Now, he made a deal with the IBF because they asked him to put uh, Fuse Lee and Ogawa on because he's gone missing. So the case was, yeah, okay, as long as Cordina fights a winner. As far as I'm concerned, that's a done deal. But then, in the meantime, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything that's going on. Um, behind the scenes, 
I'm still waiting for my show to be announced three, four weeks before it gets announced. But in the meantime, in between that, um, me being told I'm fighting for it and three, four weeks before it gets announced, the fight's off pretty much because he's come back on the scene. But you've already made the deal. So why are you going back on your deal to make another deal with them for, for me to fight? It don't make sense. So, yeah, okay, we've, we've, um, they've done the deal. But like I said, I'm unaware of all this until after my fight in a post-fight press conference. So I'm sat there in a post-fight press, I'm buzzing, and then you got Eddie saying, well, no, Tony said, well, this fight was off. I looked at him, and then I looked at him, and Eddie was sort of, yeah, it was off. It, it, it wasn't happening. So I'm shocked. I'm thinking, oh, my God. Like, I said it would have been murder if that, that was the case. I've trained all this time, 10, 12 weeks, and it's off. So... Yeah, this. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, it, it was a. Uh, it was a bit of a difficult time for me to sort of process. Sometimes, as cruel as it, as cruel as it was, sometimes things happen for a reason. You've already completed your dream of becoming a world champion. Now, potentially in your next fight, you can be a two-time world champion. Surely that's got to, you know, really get your buzz in and get the juices. Saving flowing. grace, isn't it? That yeah, you have got first yeah. The winner. But that's just trying to make it sound good to me. I don't want to be stripped. I shouldn't have been stripped. Yeah, two times do sound good without being beat. But at the same time, I shouldn't have been stripped in the first place. Especially with the number of champion in recess belts that are thrown around for, for situations that have got nothing to do with the champion in recess. You are, you are the dictionary definition of a champion in recess. A champion that, through unforeseen circumstances, injury or, or illness, is, is out for a fairly specified amount of time. You know it's not going to be longer than a year. You know you're going to be back at some point in 2023. The right thing to do would have been to, to have made you the, the effect of a champion in recess, put up uh, an interim belt, and then the two merge when you then face the winner. That's that's what I guess should have been done. And, uh, and I, I understand your frustration because we are in a sport where it does seem like sanctioning bodies make things up as as they go along. But I guess we are where we are, and, and you wish self. Uh, why why strip me if if I'm fighting the winner? It would, the same scenario is happening. Yeah. So fight for the interim title. Fight me. But you've just you've just. You've just messed it all up. Took the belt off me. You know, I've never this seen Joe Cordina annoyed before, no, and I've no. known you for I've known you for eight years. Oh, I'll tell you what, I was annoyed with him earlier when he made us sit at the front of the, <laughs> world, of the world's <laughs> fastest roller coaster. Uh, but the best was that he wasn't of that one. It was when he was saying, "I'm falling out, dude," but he all the way around. <laughs> oh, honestly, out. what I was falling, falling out of it. I was out, screaming. Mate. The engineers have worked it out. You weren't falling out. Yeah, it oh, was, uh, that was funny. So Jess McCaskill, one half of uh, our chief support. On, uh, on Saturday night. Uh, and Joe, I know you'll be, be yeah. watching Ringside Saturday night. Are you yeah. going to be here? Well, not going to be an easy know. one to watch. Might be in Hackerson somewhere, having food or something. Nah, I will be there, of course. Of course. Good man. Uh, right, well, I appreciate you talking Thank you. to us. And, well, all the best with getting healed up and, and back on the road to full fitness again. Joe Cordina. Thank you. Big man. Jessica McCaskill from St. Louis, two-weight world champion. And she could become undisputed in two-weight classes. A massive opportunity for her Saturday night live on the zone. She made three defences of the undisputed championship. She won at 147 from uh, long-reigning champion Cecilia Breaker, summer of 2020. The rematch with Breaker was last year. And after uh, a close-fought contest first time round, she started like a bull in the rematch against Breaker, straight to the centre, physical uh, as ever, she hurt her early in the contest, set a stall out with real intent. She is a proper gunslinger. Had a lot of success with that big right hand that you see there. And, well, we expect her, Darren, to start as she always does. Fast, aggressive, come forward. Look, uh, this potentially could be as good as Taylor Serrano. Like you pointed out there, McCaskill in her last fight, is it Vara, sorry, uh, the, the pronunciation of her last opponent? Oh, Cecilia Breakers. No, no. Oh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I think it was a Vara. Uh, she just went hell for leather for three rounds. And, and un not, sorry, not undefeated, but undisputed welterweight champion. And she's going for undisputed in another weight class, super lightweight, on Saturday night. And her opponent is now making her way to the stage. She fights out of Northampton. She is undefeated. 16-0 with eight knockouts. She's the reigning, defending, 
undefeated and the unified WBC and IBF super lightweight champion of the world. Please welcome Chantel Il Capo Cameron. Cameron. Yes, I, I, I just feel when I look at this stylistically, I know exactly how McCaskill is going to approach the fight. And I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, Jamie Moore, Nigel Travis will be saying, look, be smart, don't get greedy, use your boxing brain. Hopefully she can walk onto one McCaskill, because I know she's going to try and be predominantly on the front foot. But I just, just watching Chantel Cameron in the past, what I've seen, there's that fire in her eyes. There's that grit and determination. And I do feel that she will get dragged in to a fight for quite a lot of this content and that's why I think it's going to be an absolute cracker. She's only been defeated twice, Jess McCaskill. Once was it against Katie Taylor at 135 pound, her last fight at 135. And Taylor really boxed, moved, didn't let her, her settle and set her feet. Um, and in comes Jess McCaskill, Jess, great to see you. That was a long workout. <laughs> it's nothing, nothing. <laughs> we'll warm up. So you've got your, your opponent, uh, Chantel Cameron, uh, in the ring. How have your preparations been ahead of this fight? Preparation has been top notch, grade A, from the dieting, the nutrition, to the strength and conditioning, to the sparring partners. It's all been just 100%. Because, of course, coming back down to, to 140 pound after four or five fights there. But, of course, people forgetting that you came up originally from 135. Yeah. How has how things felt coming back down again to 140? It's been great. I was on weight about a month ago. No problems with the weight. The training regimen that Rick Ramos has for me is, like, massive. So I have to eat. No matter what weight I'm at, I have to eat, like, constantly. So it's been really good. Don't want to get in into this fight too tactically because I know you're not going to give too much away but tell us what you know about Chantel Cameron what what are her uh, strengths and weaknesses in your her, her strength is running um, I was told I was told that she holds a little bit too I haven't really watched so I've maybe watched maybe a round or two of her fights I don't really watch a lot of tape only because I found that watching tape um, puts me in, a, in the incorrect mindset. I'm waiting for something to happen. I'm looking for it. I find myself doing those things. So it's just easier not to watch tape at all. So, you know, I just, I, I plan for her to hold when she gets hit because that's what everybody does when I fight them. They hold a lot once they feel my power. And then any other kind of exit strategy that she might have, you know, shuffling, stepping back, that kind of thing. So that's really what I'm looking for. We're going to expect a fast start from you as always. I don't, I don't think I know how to, you know, start, start slow. slow. No, that means you I do. think my whole career, Rick has been telling me, you got to start faster, you got to start faster from having, you know, four two-minute rounds, which isn't a lot, to uh, training, we train three-minute rounds, and then when you switch from training three-minute rounds to fighting two-minute rounds, you're losing a whole minute, so you got to start faster. So now we train with two-minute rounds, and so everything is just like 100 miles an hour from start to finish. Just moving away from the fight slightly, what is your take and your view on potentially women fighting at three minute rounds? I'm down for it as, as long as someone says that it's safe. I, I would like for a health official, a doctor of some sort, to give us the okay. We know that women cannot take as much, you know, physical taxing uh, punches the way that men can. And honestly, the pool of women is so small. As soon as a female gets hurt from a fight, they're on a 60, 90 day suspension. So then they're out. And so that's how the pool gets smaller and smaller. So you don't want that. So as soon as somebody says it's okay, then, then let's go. But maybe until then we can start with 12 two minute rounds or something like that. For, uh, for many fighters, I think the, the dream of becoming undisputed is, is so far away. For you, you are now three days, two days away from becoming potentially a two-weight undisputed champion. Just put into context for us what, what that would mean to you if you had your hand raised on Saturday. It's, it's just a massive dream that I didn't know that I had, an opportunity that I never knew would actually come. So to be like days away from it, it's, it's just really amazing. You know, you try not to live in the moment too much because you have a job to do, but also you want to feel those feels because when are you, when are you going to have that opportunity again? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's just an absolute pleasure to, to speak to you. Wish you all the very best on, on Saturday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, Chris, I've got to leave you. I'm actually off. I'm a bit worried, actually, because I'm not a great flyer, but I'm... Uh, 
jumping on a helicopter with Eddie Hearn and Joe Cordina. As we're doing a Q&A in You're Dubai. Going where? I, I'm, I'm heading off to Dubai. I've got to quickly jump on a helicopter. So I've got to love you and leave you. You're going in a helicopter? <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow, well, mate. Why did I find out about this kind of stuff? Ridiculous. See you, mate. See you, mate. Take care. He lives a ridiculous life. <laughs> to Chantel Cameron. In the ring with Nigel Travis. I'm riding solo now, folks, while Darren Barker takes a helicopter to Dubai. There is absolutely no justice in this world. But I hear we might get a word with Alicia Baumgartner. Unified uh, super featherweight world champion after uh, a brilliant fight with Michaela Mayer a couple of weekends ago. Chateau Cameron in the ring, El Capo, the boss, a ninth fight under the guidance of the man on the pads, Nigel Travis and Jamie Moore as well. She's looked better and better these last two to three years. They linked up at the start of 2019, she became world champion against Adriana Dos Santos Araujo, who well, she missed weight by a mile. She was nearly 146 pounds in that fight, meaning she was ineligible for the title. Cameron, of course, still was. With me, she was giving up eight pounds in weight, the full weight division in real terms. She hit the scales at 137. Araujo, solid, heavy-handed. Cameron had to keep her turning pot shot from range. She boxed well against the woman who beat Natasha Jonas and Mira Potterkinen in Olympic year Green Underwood too. Then she fought Melissa Hernandez, who's her next challenger, the Miami-based Puerto Rican. We had a good win over the unbeaten Selena Barrios to secure a title shot in Las Vegas on the Haney Lazaris undercard. Cameron was dominant in that fight. Erta early put her down in, in the fourth round. And when she had Hernandez upstairs, hurt, she continued to, to rip the body. She may need to, to take something out of Jess McCaskill to stop her coming forward on Saturday night. That was an early stoppage by the referee. It was one way trapped and Hernandez wasn't in the fight. Look better and better with each passing contest under the guidance of the man on the pads in, in Manchester. She's in her prime as champion, and when that four woman tournament came around, she looked the slight favourite alongside Kaylee Reese. But of course, with the fight falling through, with Kaylee Reese uh, landing a role in True Detective, she is now in an undisputed world title fight on Saturday night against Chicago's Jessica McCaskill. And well, we've had some unbelievable women's fights this year, and one that sits right amongst them, another big victory for Alicia Baumgartner, who burst onto the scene in the UK earlier this year with that amazing win over Terry Harper. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself in against Michaela May in the UK, in London, packed arena, and what performance it was, what a close fight. Congratulations, first of all. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. I'm feeling super blessed to be here. Abu Dhabi, it's fight week. It just, I love being in the boxing atmosphere. Um, you were, you were dominant in the early stages of, of that fight. You couldn't miss Michaela Mayer. The jab, that counter right hand over her jab. She had to really work her way back into uh, the contest. How did you feel the fight was going here, when you were in it? Did you get a perception of, of where you are in the fight? How the fight's going? I'm sorry, by the way, it is so loud in here. You cannot hear yourself think, let alone speak. We'll wait for David to speak. We'll come back and we'll talk to we'll talk to Alyssa. I love this fight. It's a great fight. It's the chief support, so you definitely do not want to miss it. Chantel Cameron and Jessica McCaskill for the undisputed super lightweight championship of the world. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to do the open workout for our main event of the evening. As Mr. Eddie Hearn from Matchroom Boxing, in association with World of Boxing, Golden Boy Promotions, and Zerto Promotions, are proud to present. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA Light Heavyweight Championship of the World. It's going to take place at the Etihad Arena here in Abu Dhabi. And we're sponsored by Palm Sports, Stage Front, Wow Hydrate, and Visit Abu Dhabi.
ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please welcome to the ring the challenger. He's a southpaw, hence the name Zerdo. 44-0 undefeated, 30 big wins coming by way of knockout. He's the former WBO super middleweight champion of the world, presentando de Mazatlan, Sinaloa, Mexico. Ranked number one in the world by the WBA, la nueva sensación de boxeo, Gilberto Zerdo Ramirez. Ramirez. So one half of the main event in the ring. Alicia, I think you can hear me a little bit better now. Can you? Okay, great. Um, you, you came into the fight as a world champion already, but this had a little bit of something different, didn't it? I had the spice to build up and then the delay. Can you just talk me through the process of the five weeks in between the two fights? How you, how you kind of, you must have had to add some calories back into your diet and then cut down again. How were those five weeks in between the delay and, and the reschedule? Yeah, the five weeks were actually a, a plus to me. I took everything as a positive. I never had any issues with weight. So I was able just to go back into the gym, have an even harder training camp, you know, continue still eating the way I ate prior to, and just sharpen up everything. Everything that I thought was good, I did better. So you felt even better going into the Oh, fight, absolutely, huh? absolutely, yes. So what I was saying before was you started really well in the fight. May have dragged herself back into it in the middle rounds. How did you feel it was going by round six or seven? Do you have an idea of where you are in the fight? Did you feel ahead or did you know it was close? I definitely knew I was ahead. I knew that I was landing the harder punches. I was sharper. I was more decisive for the judges to see what punches were being landed, you know? Even though Mayer was coming forward, I was still keeping that jab. I was keeping that jab out there and, and throwing it very hard to keep her at bay to let my combinations go. Is there anything she did that surprised you in the fight? Nothing. Uh, and Hugh Me Choi next, is that the plan? That's the plan. I would love that fight. My goal has always been undisputed at 130. I'm super close. And again, you know, the work is never done. Awesome. Great to see you. Thank you so much for Thank your you. time. Alicia, congratulations on the win. We look forward to seeing you again next year. Uh, Alicia Baumgartner, the, uh, the new unified super featherweight women's champion. And Gilberto Ramirez, former super middleweight champion, currently in the ring. Okay, Gilberto Ramirez then has gone through his workout, one half of uh, our main event, uh, and I've got one half of the chief support uh, with me. We heard from Jess McCaskill about 10 minutes ago. Chancellor Cameron, big night for you on Saturday. How are you feeling? Feeling great, yeah. What a place to be for a fight week. Right. I'm uh, feeling fantastic, yeah. It's unreal. What an experience this is so far already. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your, your preparation for this. You've been sparring, uh, I know Aki Piaz has talked about that. Jack Catchable as well? Yeah, Akiv, Jack Carroll, Sean, all the lads in the gym. So Jack goes orthodox, does he? he yeah, he goes all, yeah, he does. He switch it off, so he does, goes orthodox and he, uh, we hustle. Good man, that's, uh, that's good. Um, we, were, we were talking to uh, Jess about your strengths and weaknesses. Um, what do you make of, of her? Because we know she starts fast. Ladies Are you expecting her to try anything now, different on Saturday? The challenges, sir. Yeah, she'll, uh, she'll, she'll come right out looking for a dog fight. But uh, I've got a good work mate, so I'll be there as well. And what, sort of fight, out. what sort of fight do you want on Saturday? I, I, I always like putting on a good show, so I don't want to be in there and watching some of Jessica's fights. So she's not the best to watch. I think she's uh, not easy on the eye. So I don't want to be dragged into that sort of fight where I'm like 
having a dog dog fight where does it, I don't need to. Like I know I can box there is if I want to, but when I need to, I'm going to stand there and trade. But I want to put on a good performance and show boxing. Not bo not. I don't want to be in there having an ugly fight. Because Katie Taylor kind of dealt with her, took the momentum away, just stuck and moved, stuck and moved, walked her onto shots. Have you watched that fight? Is that kind of a blueprint for for how to deal with her in a in a pretty comfortable fashion? Yeah, um, obviously me and Katie Taylor are completely different styles as yeah, well. Very but style, yeah. the team team I've got, they've they've dealt with an A, B, and C. So we've got everything covered. We've got every every box ticked off, and yeah, ready to rock and roll. I spoke to Aki Fiaz about this a little bit earlier on. Just give me an idea of what it's been like since you joined Nigel and Jamie. I think it was 2018, 19, was it? Just what they've done for you as a person, as as a fighter, and your experience of training underneath them. It's always a good laugh in the gym, but when it's serious, it's serious as well. So you can't be messing about and uh, getting up to no good and stuff. You, you'll get a kick up the ass and be like, switch on now. But what a place to be because they make training enjoyable. Boxing is a hard sport. It's tough anyway. So you don't need to hate going into the gym. Whereas I love going into the gym because I know they're going to lift my mood. It's always good spirits. It's always a good laugh. And look at the tactics they always get right. You look at all of you look at our stable, the game plans they we execute because the team behind me just shows that we're such a strong team. Well, listen, uh, undisputed title on the line on Saturday, massive opportunity for you. Thank you for talking to us, and all the very best for the rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, well, we've got plenty coming up on the zone over the next few weeks. Uh, let's. Got a promo for you, and then we're gonna. Sorry, today's been chaos, by the way. I'm sure it hasn't passed you by. Uh, we haven't even got Darren Barker in the studio. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's head to this. We'll come back, uh, and we'll get to meet you in the ring. Fight fans, welcome to the The Zone Boxing Show. Bringing you all the exclusive news, interviews, and outspoken views from the world of boxing. I'm back in beast mode. The fight starts now. Catch the latest boxing news every single weekday. I'm gonna be honest, man. That kid's pissing me off. This is what boxing's all about. From the best fighters to the biggest in the world, fighting out of Indio, California. 20 and 0, 11 knockouts. Saturday night, he'll be making his ninth defense of his world title. Ladies and gentlemen, Dimitri Beevil. Beevil. The light heavyweight WBA world champion Dimitri Bivol. After one of the victories of the year against Canelo Alvarez on Cinco de Mayo, putting his name on the boxing map. So many people wrote him off, and while well, he made pretty easy work of it in the end, didn't he? Master of distance, timing, range, an underrated power puncher as well. But he is in. A big, big fight with a big, strong man in Zerdo Ramirez. Uh, come and join me in the studio, sir. It's lovely to meet you. We haven't met before. Um, but this, of course, is a huge opportunity for, for you as well on, on Saturday night. How are you feeling ahead of, uh, of the fight? I feel great. I feel exciting for this Saturday. And I want to take everything. I want to take the belt. And it's exciting because be here in Abu Dhabi with all the people. It's really kind, uh, the people here. And, and it's a different country for me. And, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a dream, it's a dream. Yeah, the opportunity to become a, a two-weight world champion for you against the man who proved himself against your, your Mexican countrymen uh, last time out as well. Is this, is this one for the Mexican people as well as for yourself? Yes, of course. I will do it for uh, all the, the Mexican people. It will be a, a revenge, not only for Canelo, if I, it will be for the whole country, for all the Latino, for all Mexican people. What do you do differently to Canelo in this fight on Saturday? Well, um, throw a lot of punches and go to the body. And I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's really exciting for me to be here. Really exciting to uh, see a big ball. And I, I, want, I, want to take a, I want to take the belt, two-time world champion. That's, that's my dream come true, and I will do it this Saturday. He's got very quick feet, Dimitri Bivol. Good timing, good distance. That body work early in the fight, we know you like to throw that left hand to the body. Do you need to try and slow his feet down to get to work? Well, I think he's a, a, a good champion. He's a good champion. He's a good fighter. But the only thing he had to fight me, he had to face me. That's the only, only bad for him because I will take the belt and that's it for him. That's the last uh, title defense for him. 
Yeah. Well, it's been uh, really good to meet you. Thank you for your time and, and all the very best on, on Saturday. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Muchas gracias a toda la gente por el apoyo. No se pierda la pelea el sábado, 5 de noviembre, aquí en Abu Dhabi. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm sure you lot understood that at home. I didn't, but thank you very much. And uh, great to meet you, Gilberto. Cheers. Gilberto Ramirez in the studio with us. Dimitri Pivot in the ring. The other half of the main event on Saturday night from Abu Dhabi live on the zone. against the, the tall figure of great spider Richards in the fight before Canelo. He had uh, the best part of two years out of the ring during the pandemic, had a bit of rust to shake off, was in control of a competitive contest and perhaps felt they hadn't seen the very best of him. And then the Canelo fight got made. Of course, Canelo chasing those legacy fights at super middleweight and, and up at light heavy too, defeating Sergo Kovalev for the WBO strap before this and Pivot just a, a step too far. Feet were good, the power was good. Canelo felt that the force of those shots on the gloves early, he knew that he couldn't take liberties, knew he couldn't take too many risks and Pivot just dictated him at range. So smooth, so relaxed. An underrated puncher as well. Posted to a wide decision victory in Las Vegas to retain his title, become the only second man to beat Canelo Alvarez since he was a 23-year-old against Floyd Mayweather all those years ago. And now his name is on the map. He is one of the men to beat in that powerful pound boxing list. Can Zerdo Ramirez do it? Can he exert the pressure? How will he respond when that first right hand from Dimitri Bivol lands? No doubt it will. Completely contrasting styles, Bivols. It's not a huge light heavyweight. Those of you who've seen him or, or met him in person will know it's more like the, the kind of size you expect from a super middleweight, six foot, maybe six foot one. Gilberto Ramirez is, is the best part of six four. Big southpaw, busy. As you mentioned, can he land that left hand to the body? Can he take the legs of this man away and slow him down? That has to be part of the game plan. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Yas Island in Abu Dhabi. We are 
just a couple of days away now from fight night in the UAE. There is the WBA light heavyweight world champion, Dimitri Bivolt. A unique style, almost like on ice skates, isn't it? Just gliding in and out of range. How easy will he be to pin down for Gilberto Ramirez? Such a, a complete fighter these days. You've seen him really hurt once in a kind of mini crisis. That was... Uh, round 11 in an otherwise totally dominant display against Joe Smith Jr. back in 2019. He was in control through 10 rounds and was caught right on the belt at the end of the round, looping over ham right, caught him high on the side of the head, above the, the left ear, just completely switching him off. Staggered back to his corner on unsteady legs. He had 60 seconds of recovery in between round 10 and 11, came back and had to stay out of danger. Stayed disciplined, got on his bike, picked the odd single in return, allowed himself to recover again before dominating the 12th round. And well, for the 160 rounds he's boxed in his 20 fights so far, sometimes it's the one or two rounds that don't go right for the fighter when you learn something equally as important about them. Maybe with the Mosey round two, another example of that for Bivol, for all his consistency and brilliance and dominance in so many of those 160 rounds. We know too from that moment against Joe Smith Jr., he can manage a crisis as well. Will he have the weather one on Saturday night? For Ramirez, he came up to light heavyweight after that second fight with Jesse Hart. He won both of those contests, kind of 60-40 territory. The Hart believes that Ramirez doesn't like pressure. And since he's come up for a, a very solid level of B-string fighters with winning records, guys on the fringe of world level, Guys who've fallen short at world level, like Tommy Carpenter, Alfonso Lopez, Sullivan Barrera, Uni Gonzalez, Dominic Bosell. They've got good records between them, 136 wins against 18 combined, but there's a lot of padding across those records. And he said he's felt much better at 175 Ramirez. He's looked good too, stopped all five of those opponents at various points in contest. Probably the best of those wins on paper, the Cuban Sullivan Barrera. Very nearly lasted 12 against Bivol in 2018 in what was uh, a complete shutout for the man on the screen. But against Ramirez, he only lasted four. I think one of the problems he had, which he's had several times throughout his career, is he's vulnerable early. It's caught cold and hurt in the first three or four rounds. It was against Lee Campbell, Joe Smith, Andre Ward, Barrera, a good fighter. He was 39 last year when he fought Ramirez. In terms of common opponents, hard to discern whether that tells us anything about the way these two will match up. It probably doesn't, in truth. Can he dominate the distance and range as he does so easily against so many opponents? And it's a big, strong, busy southpaw. Defending Inzardo on the feet of WBA light heavyweight champion of the world, Dimitri Bivol. Main event Saturday night at the Out Arena Matchroom Boxing in association with World of Boxing, Golden Boy Promotions, and Zerto Promotions. It's an incredible fight card. The Champion Series happens on Saturday night. And you've got the world champion in the main event right here. Chakram Giasov in the house also from World of Boxing. Great to see him. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, Dimitri Bivol. Dimitri Bivol. Oh! We got the whole gang in here. Great to see you. Israel Madrimov, ladies and gentlemen. Shakram Giyasov. The World of Boxing team in full effect. And Dimitri Bivol right here. Oh, MJ. Ladies and gentlemen, unified super bantamweight champion of the world right here from Uzbekistan. It's his birthday today. MJ's birthday is today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, dear Kaka. Happy birthday to you. All right, champion of the world right there, MJ. Great to see you. All right, Dimitri Bivol, main event, Zerto Ramirez, WBA Light Heavyweight Championship of the World. Dimitri, great to see you again. I don't know if you remember, last time we spoke on Zoom, you showed me your friend's Lego set. You remember this? Uh, my friends, where it was? You had Lego? Yeah. 
Lego. Friends. Ah, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, that was you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, yeah. How has your life changed since you beat Canelo Alvarez? Uh, just people, just more people recognize me now. Uh, and I feel the respect of them. And uh, I got this fight. It's, uh, it's great. It's taken a long time to earn that respect, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, it's a long time, but... Uh, but it's fine. It's, uh, I think it's uh, now because uh, the guts want that. And this is a very different challenge to Canelo Alvarez, isn't it, Saturday? Of course it's different because uh, the guys are, are different, 100% different. And, uh, but the, I love challenges and it, it's good for me that uh, my opponent has a 44 victories and zero loss. Will it be 44 and one? On Saturday? Oh, uh, I hope, I hope, I believe. I, I'm here, I'm, I train for that, you know. And then on to the biggest year of your career, 2023, Baturbiev, that's the, that's the fight you want, isn't it? Типа хочу ли... Yeah, yeah, maybe the biggest, uh, yeah. And uh, of course I want to fight for more belts. Uh, it's my goal. I want to make a history, you know. Yeah. All Star Saturday night. All the very best of luck. Thank you yes. for talking. Thank to you us. so much, Dimitri Bivol, WBA light heavyweight champion uh, of the world. One half of our main event here uh, in the UAE uh, live on Saturday. Thank you very much. Live on Saturday night on the zone. Well, at this point, I'd normally say from Chris Lloyd and Darren Barker, but I think he's probably at about fifteen thousand feet right now. Uh, so, from myself, thanks for watching this afternoon. We will see you uh, at the press conference tomorrow, local time at one o'clock. Take care. Thanks for your company this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. It's now time for the featured bout of the evening. From the four corners of the world, to the four corners of this ring, the fight starts now!